My name is Pat Carter. I'm a family doctor and geriatrician. I, I do still see patients. I have a small, loyal population of patients who have stuck with me for almost 20 years now at Kelsey Siebold. Um, the reason I'm talking to you is that as, as my medical director job, uh, I take care of our capitated population. So I'm sort of the guy that is responsible for doing utilization management, case management, affiliate provider networks, all that kind of stuff that health plans do. Uh, if you're familiar with capitation, you know that a capitated medical group has to have practically every function that a health plan does. And so um, I'm sort of the guy that stuff flows to at Kelsey uh, in that regard. Um, in a nutshell, I'm going to talk about ACOs today. And this is my sort of uh, snide commentary on what an ACO is. It's the latest attempt to have somebody, anybody please, uh, take responsibility for controlling total health care costs and ensuring overall quality of care for a given population. Um, in my mind, it's, it's the latest attempt uh, to address the problem that we have in America today of very high costs and upwardly spiraling costs and yet a fairly spotty performance on quality. I do believe that the best health care in the world is available in America, but trying to piece it together from sort of the fragmented system we have and making it affordable for people to be able to access it, that's the big problem. That's, this is what the ACO is designed to, uh, to remedy. Um, who, the, who is the somebody uh, to take responsibility? In my mind, it's the doctors. So, I have no problem saying that physicians, I think, are a large part of the problem that we have, to be honest with you, especially with the upwards, upwardly spiraling costs. And I think doctors really need to be part of the solution, or maybe the biggest part of the solution. And so an accountable care organization that's run by physicians, preferably ones that actually see patients and all that, I think is a demonstratedly a good way to take care of patients, lower total medical costs. There, there are many of us up and running today, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but the ACO is something that's not a unicorn, it actually exists. Kelsey Siebold's one of them, but there are several others throughout the country, and I'll try to give you an idea of what we do and why what we do is different. I've pieced together this talk from a talk I've typically given to doctors, so you're, you're probably a less surly group than they are typically uh, when, I, when I try to explain, hey, this new great way to do things. So usually it's a bunch of doctors looking at me very skeptically. Um, the, the ACO is certainly not the first attempt to try to control costs, uh, managed care. Uh, when I came to Kelsey Siebold in 1994, it was really the heyday of the managed care revolution. We did a lot of capitated business. Back then, about 70% of our patients were capitated. Um, we're still doing it. You know, I think we sort of we solved the, you know, the, the riddle of capitation. A lot of people didn't, and so that's why that's not that many people do it. But I can tell you it really does work. Anyway, the managed care era of the 90s, I think, was the most serious attempt on the part of health plans to control costs. And really, when you get right down to it, <clears throat> it was trying to control or, or influence physician behavior. Uh, the tools they used, mostly it was utilization management. The mother may I idea that before I do this expensive test or send the patient to do whatever else this thing is that's expensive, I needed to get approval from the health plan. There were also some economic incentives back in those days. Capitation was one of them, but uh, shared savings programs, those sort of things were not unusual back in the 90s. And this is my, this is my uh, comment to the doctors in the crowd. Everybody loved it not, because most physicians just, just drove them crazy. And I think a lot of it was the, due to the fact that they saw the health plan is up here, I'm down here, my patients are over here. This, they are trying to keep me from doing what I need to do with these patients. No matter what they say, I'm going to hate it. And, and patients picked up on that fairly quickly, as you might guess. Um, in the case of a capitated practice like Kelsey Siebold, most of the time we were able to insulate ourselves from it, and so we did sort of start taking responsibility back then. And I can tell you, as someone who works in that system, it just works a lot better than having this sort of external body telling you what to do all the time. Um, healthcare is a market, you know, for better or for worse. You guys see it more than I do, but a lot of people say, well, how come the, you know, how come the free market doesn't control healthcare costs? And it's, it's not a, it's not a, you probably can't call it a free market. You know, it's got third-party payers, got you know, it's got brokers, all kinds of people involved with um, how the the relationship between the physician and the patient and the hospital and all that. But uh, you'd think that in some way competition might drive costs down, um, and but it hasn't really happened that way so much. Again, this is just me talking. I do think that. To a large extent, we focus a whole lot on discounts, and in the long run, that may not be the best way to control total medical costs. So, um, 
the health plans really do work hard, and I know you all do this as well, trying to get the best discounts, trying to get the best rates from all the various players in the healthcare field. Um, but as discounts have trended upwards, so have total medical costs. You know, there's way to, ways to get around increased discounts. You know, raising your charge master, doing more stuff, that kind of thing. So it hasn't really resulted in a lower total medical cost by any means. Um, in my mind, discounts to a large extent have become the way that health plans take patients from one another, okay? And they kind of trade patients back and forth sometimes and those discounts ramp up. Well, still the total cost does not seem to be going down. Discounts so far, at least, have not really had a tremendous uh, uh, effect on total medical costs. And one big reason for it is that doctors can generate their own demand for services, okay? I'll go into this a little more detail lately, later. You're probably very familiar with this idea that you cut my pay, fine, I'll just do more stuff. And I'm the one who gets to decide who to do it. So, like I say, doctors, I'm, I think, I think until you get the doctors really, uh, you know, engaged in this and have, you know, figure out how they can do well by doing good, you're still you're going to have this problem no matter what you do. Um, why health plans can't control medical costs? You can't control cost and ensure quality of health care without being able to control physicians' behavior. And you can imagine how that goes over in a room full of doctors. You know what we really need to, really do is you're the problem and let's control your behavior. But the fact is. It's a big part of the problem, and, and getting doctors to do the right thing all the time solves a fair amount of this. Not everything, but it's a big, it's a big hurdle to overcome. Physician ordering accounts for, most people say, over 85% of health care costs. And when I, when I say that, what I'm talking about is the health care costs the health plans pay for, or the employers pay for. So the doctor doesn't, I don't have a lot to do with somebody going to GNC and buying a bunch of vitamins or that sort of stuff, the sort of non-covered stuff, but as far as anything that a health plan is going to cover, most of the time there's a doctor's order in there somewhere. It's either with a pen or with a mouse or whatever, but we, we steer a lot of the costs. We may not be incurring it all ourselves necessarily, but as I order various things, I always give the example, you know, I'm a family doctor, we're the cheapest provider, you know, if you're talking about physicians, we're about as cheap as you can get. And if you come into me with a very common problem, you got a cold, you know, something your mother would have patted you on the head and, and taken care of for you. Well, now you come in to see me and you're 45 years old and, you know, I can do, I, I, can, I can really affect the amount of money that goes towards taking care of you and your cold. I can either, in my mind, do the right thing, examine you, talk to you, look at your throat and all that, say, well, I think it's a virus. You know, let's, let's have you take some fluid, you know, drink plenty of fluids, take Tylenol, take some Robitussin. These are the things to watch out for. Call me if anything like that happens, and away you go. The, the charge is my office visit fee plus five bucks for your Tylenol or something. So exact same patient can come into, you know, the other me or my colleague who says, "Oh well, you know, um, you don't have a fever, but you said you had one. I better get a blood count, make sure you're okay." And uh, I, well, your lungs sound pretty clear, but you said you're coughing some stuff up. Probably I get a chest X-ray just to make sure you don't have pneumonia. <coughs> And, uh, well, you know, chest x-ray looked all right, but you said last time this happened, you did develop a pneumonia. I should probably treat you with some Zithromax, you know, just to make sure that, that you're going to be all right. And uh, I care about you deeply, so I'd like to see you back in two days to make sure that, you know, everything's okay. And, you know, it goes from an $85 office visit plus five bucks worth of Tylenol to 500 bucks, you know, easily. And we are the cheapest cog in the wheel, all right? You, you go to the cardiologist with your atypical chest pain, and one will say, that's nothing, it's your rib cage bothering you, and the other one, let's do a cath on you. It's that, I mean, it's huge amounts of money. And, and so that's where the idea of doctors generating their own demand really kicks in. And I can just tell you, it actually does happen. I'm not making this up. Again, probably most of you already know that. Why is it difficult to affect physician behavior? So the, the, the basic, one of the basic points of my talk is that if you're going to do something to bend that cost curve, you got to get doctors involved. You have to have some way to influence how we do our job and try to make sure we're doing the right thing rather than a bunch of unnecessary stuff that doesn't help anybody. Well, it's not, I, don't, I don't blame health plans for not being able to influence physician behavior because it's really not their job. Uh, most physician practices are small. Doctors are their own boss or they answer to the physician leader of a small group. Small practices almost exclusively are paid on a fee-for-service basis, as are most big practices. Okay, Kelsey Siebold, we, right now, even though we do capitation, it's only about 40 to 45% of our patients. The rest are fee-for-service. 
Small practices have a strong economic incentive to overutilize, which only increases as discounts increase. Small practices are generally not well equipped to coordinate and control care across multiple providers and settings. So even if I felt like, I've, even if I'm doing the right thing as a family doctor, I really can't control how the orthopedist or the cardiologist that I refer to is going to take care of folks. I mean, maybe to some extent if I have a, a real menu of options of who I can refer to, you know, maybe, but for the most part, they're on their own and we don't, we don't you know, tell each other how to practice. Um, small practices cannot be accountable for total medical costs for that reason, and they cannot manage bundled or capitated patients. So in a small practice, solo practice, it's not a particularly workable idea to say, you, the doctor, you are going to be responsible in some way for total medical costs. Um, so one thing I'll talk about is changing the payment method. Uh, but at ACO, one of the big things about ACOs is it's, you've got to form a bigger group. When I talk to doctors, the one thing I tell them is like, Listen, if somebody tells you that you can join this ACO and keep on doing the same thing you've always done and manage your own practice, well, think twice because that's probably not going to deliver the results that an ACO needs to deliver. You've got to change the organization in some way and the payment system. Um, the theory behind the ACO concept is you cannot control costs and improve quality without being able to significantly influence physician ordering. And here's a surprise, doctors resist health plan influence over their ordering. So, hey, I'm glad you're sitting down when I told you that. Cause, uh, so, um, so really, if you're trying to control total medical costs for population, you really can't do it with small independent practices paid strictly by fee for service. And that's where somebody had the brilliant idea of doing what's called an ACO. And, and what the theory is, it's an organized group of physicians that take responsibility for cost and quality and share in the financial rewards. And that group can effectively influence physician ordering. So I'm a department chief, all right? I have 60 doctors, 60 family doctors at Kelsey that I, I hired them all, almost all. They pay a lot more attention to me as their department chief than they would to me if I was a health plan medical director, all right? They actually answer my phone calls, they return my emails. We get to have department meetings, and I get, we get to spew this stuff out every single month, and eventually they get the idea that the culture of Kelsey Siebold is to do the right thing, and one big thing we do is to try to not do the wrong stuff. It doesn't help anybody and increases costs for sure and very likely will decrease quality because things lead to complications and, and away we go. Um, I mentioned the ACOs are not a unicorn. The prototype in my mind for the ACO is a capitated multi-specialty group practice and the biggest example and the oldest example is Kaiser Permanente out in California. So if anybody thinks this is somebody in an ivory tower dream this up, it's never gonna happen, it already, it already exists. They're not the only ones. Kelsey Siebold is absolutely one. Scott and White, um, Oxner Clinic, you know, places like that. Big group practices uh, throughout the country uh, in, most, in most ways are ACOs. In fact, my point is that if there's a multi-specialty group practice that takes capitation and has not gone out of business, they are an ACO. You really can't make it as a capitated group without having the systems in place and the physician culture of cost effectiveness. Otherwise, you can go broke taking capitation very quickly. So uh, we're not the only ones, but, but we're, the, we're the ones here in Houston that, that managed to survive. Um, what's the characteristics of an ACO? It's a large provider group. It has to have doctors. It may have hospitals as well. So hospitals are providers as well. I don't think you can have an ACO really without having physicians in it. So a hospital by itself, I don't think can do it. Hospital physician organization can. And a, and a physician organization by itself, like Kelsey Siebel, certainly can. It must provide care across multiple locations, specialties, and age ranges. So I've already seen signs, you know, we're the oncology ACO, we're the orthopedic ACO. You know, we're doing this thing that uh, we're calling an ACO, but uh, unless you can really uh, cover all the bases, unless they're taking responsibility for newborns and elderly and orthopedics and oncology and all that stuff, uh, I don't think most experts would call that an accountable care organization. It has to plan prospectively for its budgets and resource needs. And I call this, I, when I talk to doctors, I say this is like being a real company that makes a real product, okay? It's, and I compare it all the time to the car industry, and I apologize, apologies to, to Matt and Jody, you've heard this a thousand times, but 
I feel like healthcare today, from the point of view of a patient, <coughs> it's like trying to take the to buy the pieces of a car and build it yourself. All right. So health plans provide access to the pieces of care, but so you might need a you might see, see a gastroenterologist. So you've got the gastroenterology piece over here. You've got the oncology piece over here. You've got the family medicine piece over here. You've got the pediatric piece down there. Um, but can you put it together to form a, a coherent product? And I think right now the typical answer is no. So you wind up with the equivalent, I stre I'll stretch this car analogy as far as you'll let me, but you wind up with the equivalent of, hey, you know, I got, um, I got five steering wheels because the doctor, you know, the, the mechanic told me I really needed five just in case the first four don't work, you know. And, but I got a great rate. And the, these are the cheapest steering wheels, better than anybody else in town. And so I got that. You know, I got, I got three hood ornaments. I got, uh, you know, an eight-cylinder car, but they sold me 16 pistons because, you know, they weren't sure about that first date. So there's another set just in case. And, you know, if I didn't know much about cars, which I don't much anymore, and which most people don't know about healthcare, you get, we, sell, we do this all the time. We sold you an MRI that no one thought, no expert would have thought was needed, but you thought it was needed, because I told you it was needed, but it didn't really help me in treating you, you know. I sold you a spinal fusion when you would have gotten better on your own. You know, I sold you a cardiac cath when anybody could tell that this was non-cardiac chest pain that you had. You know, it's just what, it's just what happens. So I'll stop with the car thing for a while, but, but that's the idea. So, and you have to support comprehensive, valid, and reliable measure of its performance. So when we talk about healthcare today, you know, we talk a lot about quality and how can a patient figure out, well, what's the best quality doctor to see? Well, as I said, to me, patients got to choose from a huge menu of, first of all, who do I even need to see? You know, do I need to see an orthopedist for this sprained ankle? Should I see an internist or family doctor? Should I see a sports medicine doctor? Um, what's the quality of these folks? I don't know. You know, you, looking at quality on individual doctors is really hard to do. Uh, we can always game the system. We can always do things that make us look better than we probably really are. So in my mind, it's a lot easier buying a car today than it is buying health care. So I may not, I may like Volkswagens, I might like Chevys, I might like Mercedes, who knows what. But with the exception of a lemon here and there, for the most part, you have an idea of what you're going to get. You know what you're going to get. If you can buy a Mercedes, you're gonna get, you expect this amount of quality, this amount of cost. You've got ways to tell what the, what the performance record is and all that, safety, all that. If you want to buy a Kia, you might expect a different cost, maybe a different quality. Healthcare, you just don't have that. You know, health plans try to fill that in. Oh, Blue Cross, we're great, and this is our great doctors, and Aetna, we're great too, and it's the same doctors for the most part, you know. So hospitals do this as well. But other than the billboards, it's, it's hard to tell, you know, where is really the best place to go. So the idea behind an ACO is that, you know, in 10 or 20 years in Houston, you hopefully you'll have some idea. Well, I go to Kelsey Siebel, I got this. If I go to Memorial, I got that. If I go to Baylor, I got that. Some 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 reasonably measurable way to assess quality across systems. So that's, the, that's, the, that's how you tell if an ACO is in front of you or not. ACOs make the people in the organizations that actually provide care accountable for the quality and cost of that care. So health plans don't provide care, doctors and hospitals do. The idea is let's just put this down to the people actually doing the job, make them responsible, make them report to us what they're doing, give them an incentive to do the right thing and see what happens. That's probably as simple as I can make it. Um, you have to, in order for this to work, you really do have to move away from the adverse incentives of pure fee-for-service uh, payments. And this, I tell doctors this all the time. You all know what a CPT code is, I assume. It's how we get paid in a fee-for-service environment. Whatever we do has a CPT code attached to it. I always ask, well, what's the CPT code for avoiding an admission? All right. Probably the biggest cost-saving thing you can do, and in many ways, the biggest quality improvement thing you can do is keep people out of the darn hospital, okay? So if I got somebody who's kind of a, you know, a patient who's wavering on the borderline, if I spend a couple hours with them and give them some medicine, give them an IV, whatever, I keep them out of the hospital, that would be good for everybody. But you really don't get paid for that. You know, there's only a certain amount you can get paid in the outpatient setting for the work that you do as a physician. And believe me, you spend three or four hours tuning somebody up, you are 
you've just blown your whole day for one thing. You've taken your nurse away from being able to take care of the rest of these patients. Nobody can do it. So that's a simple uh, you know, example, but that's kind of what we're getting at. You've got to pay people differently than what, what's being done right now. Doctors lose money doing the right thing often in the current system. Um, so how do you pay ACOs? Shared risk pools was fairly common back in the 90s. That's the way the Medicare ACOs are, are funded now. So when I talk about ACOs, I'm actually I'm not actually talking about the Affordable Care Act version of the ACO, but this is, they don't do capitation in the Medicare ACOs, they do shared savings. And it's the idea if you have a certain population of patients with a certain you know, admission rate or bed day rate now, if you cut it down in the next year, you get half of what the savings, you know, that sort of thing. It's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow model. And it can work. Uh, bundle payments for episodes of care. Uh, this is one thing I think might actually be a unicorn. I'm not sure how this will wind up working, but the idea is that for a certain episode of care, a heart attack, you know, you pay the ACO, usually the hospital in that case, a certain amount of money, and the hospital is responsible for paying everybody who takes care of that patient. And it gives the hospital and everybody an incentive to do the right thing, not have the patient bounce back later because you dismissed them too early, all that kind of stuff. In theory, it's fine. In practice, to me, it's pretty complicated. Capitation is, again, I think a very simple way to pay, pay people. It's basically giving the doctor group part of the premium and saying, you handle it. And again, for the groups that have done this for a while and figured it out, that you have to take in more money than you pay out, which is the basic tenet of capitation, it works fine. And we really can make a big difference in total medical costs. So capitation is sort of the furthest, furthest along the spectrum. Um, I don't, think, I don't think it's likely that fee-for-service is going away. It's been the death of fee-for-service has been predicted for the last 30 years, still here, probably still going to be here 30 years from now. But for systems that can do this sort of stuff, I, I think it, the, the economic incentives are in the right place, and ACO is a model that they can use to go forward with. ACOs, one is the capitated multi-specialty group, uh, group practice. Physician directed, again, I feel like that's a big part of it so that the doctors working, the ones you actually need to do the right thing, are not feeling oppressed you know, by some external body that they don't like. Capitation incentivizes cost-effective evidence-based care. Uh, patients receive most, if not all, their care from the group practice. That gives you the most control over utilization. And finally, hospital may or may not be part of the ACO. At, at Kelsey Siebel, we're, we're not part of a hospital system. We use pretty much all the hospital systems in Houston, um, and we like that. Now, if we were in Beaumont or Corpus or somewhere where there's only one hospital or two hospitals or something like that, you, you may, it may make sense to bring the hospital into the system. Right now, we feel like we like to go where this region of town, that's the best hospital, that's where we want to go, and we do it. So that, that gives us a lot of flexibility that we like totally unbiased uh, opinion. This is the best way to do it. So. <laughs> uh, a hospital physician organization. This, is, this may be the most common way, to be honest with you. So uh, the in this case, the hospital is usually who provides the funds, provides the expertise to get this organization off the road. They'll typically either directly employ physicians in states where that's allowed, or in Texas, for instance, typically they'll own a 501A, which, which in turn employs the physicians. Usually there's a fee-for-service reimbursement with an incentive pool. Typically they're not capitated, although on down the road they might be. Patients are typically not locked into this system. Um, they can, they're able to go to anyone in the large health plan network. Again, that gives you less control. So I always make the point, if, if patients can see me in a PPO environment just as well as they can see me in a, in a capitated ACO type of environment, and I'm going to treat them the same way. But when they go, when, I, when they need to see the cardiologist, I like to be able to tell them to, you know, Kelsey Siebel cardiology and know what I'm going to get. If they go to the cardiologist down the street, then that's where the big money goes, and you really lose a lot of control over folks. So, um, and, you know, patients, people think, oh, they don't want to be, have to only go to one place. Well, if it's big enough and has a good enough reputation, they're fine. You know, I, we have a very loyal group of patients at Kelsey Siebel, and, you know, we've got plenty of, if there's something we can't do at Kelsey Siebel, we've got an affiliate provider network that includes everything that you would ever need. So a very high quality bunch of people. Again, we're fortunate being in Houston where everything is available. Um, the uh, hospital physician organization, oh, this is a big deal. Hospital must buy into reduced admissions. So 
if any of you are formal hosp former hospital executives or your mother was or something like that, trying to get them to buy that, that's a, that's a big hurdle because they're, they're raised from, from infants to say, I need butts in beds, let's get more people in this hospital. So they have to get over that hurdle. All right. Um, in my mind, the ACO is a reasonable concept, and I do know that it works in the, con in the uh, context of a capitated multi-specialty group practice, but it's got a long way to go, I think, before it becomes dominant or even an important part of the healthcare landscape. So what are the obstacles to forming ACOs? Uh, well, one I already talked about, 95% of all U.S. practices have five or fewer physicians. And, you know, getting hospital executives to buy into, I don't want people in my hospital is one thing, but getting, you know, solo practice doctors to say, hey, I want to join this other 50 people and, and we're going to figure out how to do this and I'm no longer going to be independent, that's, that, that's as big a hurdle, if not bigger. They've got to organize into larger groups. They have to agree on how you're going to take care of patients, okay? They have to equitably distribute income. And this is a big one, proceduralists generate cost rather than revenue. So this is out of the New England Journal, so it's not me making this up, but I can tell you that's absolutely true. At Kelsey Siebold, we started capitation back in the mid 80s, and all the people who were there, there back then said this was a big issue. You know, we're pretty much over it now, but we sympathize a lot with people trying to do this right now. So those are big things, those are big hurdles to overcome to, for physician-directed ACOs to form. Barriers to hospital controlled ACOs, you have to trade near term revenue, the admissions for long term savings. You've got to shift your thinking into this is better to keep people out of the hospital. You need to focus on outpatient care. Uh, getting, if people are in the hospital, get them out quickly, you know, those sort of things. You have to forego profits from procedures and admissions. So a hospital right now thinks, hey, I, this uh, vascular surgeon is going to come in and make a whole lot of money for me. That's fine if you've got enough business to keep a vascular surgeon occupied by doing the right, the right thing. But if you think they're going to come in and generate a bunch of new business, well, that's new cost. There's just no way around it. So getting over that hump is a big deal. Uh, hiring physicians as employees typically reduces the incentive to be productive. And that is true. <laughs> so uh, those are some of the barriers to the hospital uh, organizations. And, uh, you know, there's memorials building, building this sort of thing right now. They're dealing with all that stuff. I, I know they are. Uh, I'm running out of time. Who determines what is an ACO? Well, in case Ann Cook hasn't called you personally and told you we're an ACO, we're an ACO. We were the first in the country. Uh, NCQA started certifying last year. We got our stuff in. The biggest reason that we were the first in the country is because we were already doing all this. Okay, all the stuff we had done for the past 30 years to be able to manage a practice under capitation, including putting in electronic medical record, including putting in full disease management, uh, where we nag people all the time over the phone to come in. Uh, the, the, the idea of creating this physician culture where you know, we want you to do the right thing. You, we're not going to pay you extra to order more tests or to refer to more people. <clears throat> we're going to pay you to be a good doctor and we'll take care of the business part. But getting doctors who will buy into that, we'd already done all that. So when the time came for us to, when, when the NCQA came out and said, okay, we're ready to certify, all, all we really had to do was fill out forms. So we were already doing all the stuff that they were looking for. Uh, the Med Medicare uh, determines ACOs under the Affordable Care Act. Again, that's a different, you know, ball of wax altogether. I'm not going to go into it, but I'm happy to answer questions if you have questions about how Medicare works. Uh, this is, my, again, another snide comment from me. Who determines what is an ACO? Well, the hospital and health plan marketing departments are getting deeply into deciding who's an ACO and who's not. I call it the instant ACO, which means you have a sign and an ad and maybe a <clears throat> puff piece in the newspaper saying you're an ACO. They're self-identified, but no objective criteria measured or documented. Um, bottom line, uh, healthcare services are now mostly sold piecemeal. Um, ACOs sell the whole package of healthcare with, with control of overall cost and quality. You know, to me, it's like bu buying a whole car that somebody thought about and put the right number of pistons and cylinders and everything else into this car and ensured the quality of each piece of it versus going out and buying it on your own and building it yourself. Um, and to me, this 
This makes sense economically. So like a lot of other industries, economic fundamentals, I think, seem to favor the development of larger, more efficient organizations over time. And the ASO is a natural product of those economic realities. So with that, I will, I will stop. And if we have time for questions. Or?